Indonesia. It's my pleasure for me to be the master of ceremony of this very special occasion, the second Asian Congress of Neurological Nurses Webinar. On behalf of AGNN, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Professor Yoko Kato from Japan, the patron of AGNN, Matron Yi Jeng from Malaysia, the president of AGNN, all speakers, chairs, commentator, and all audience. AGNN webinar is part of the AGNN activities with the aim to share knowledge and skill as well as update nurses with the latest nursing management for neurological patients. There are two speakers for today. The first speaker, Professor Mojgan Hodi, and the second speaker, Professor Anila Darbar. Professor Keki Turel and Professor Azmi Alias as the chair for this webinar. Our commentator today is Professor Suresh Neil. May I now call upon Professor Yugo Kato to deliver her opening remarks. Uh, Hi. Please, Professor, yes. yours. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for support the nurse, nurse meeting uh, of the Asian Congress. Uh, I think uh, uh, not only the doctor, but also nurse and some uh, administrative parts. Uh, I think those three, uh, the will is very important to improve the patient, the, uh, the future result, I think. So the, today, uh, webinar is very gorgeous because uh, two chairs and also the commentator and the closing remark. And also, of course, the host is uh, Dr. Uh, Miss, Mrs. E and also a uh, very famous uh, uh, nurse from uh, Hoshan Hospital uh, can be the co-host. The name is Kao. So both of them are the moderates of the today's webinar. The Moji and also the Anina is a very good friend because uh, uh, Anina, we went to the Af Africa the, together. Then we spent uh, several times uh, in Africa. The she uh, is very beautiful, but she is uh, also very brave, the female. Neurosurgeon. Moji is no need to say. Uh, she is very intelligent and also that she covered so many fields, especially the functional neurosurgery. Uh, I think uh, the KK uh, Tyrell and also uh, Azmi and also the commentator, the stretch uh, maybe uh, we'll have a heat discussion uh, among adults, the, the two doctors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Kato. Now, uh, I call Matron Yi to say a few words. Please, the time is yours. We muted. Still mute? Matron Yi? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. On behalf of ACNN, I would like to thank Prof. Tato for her continuous support and opportunity given to us. And of course, special thanks to our speakers today, the chairs and Prof. Suresh, our commentator. And uh, I hope with this um, uh, webinar, the neurological nurses will be able to upgrade and update themselves during this uh, COVID pandemic. And I do hope we nurses will try our best and always give our best good quality care to our patients with this webinar uh, to improve each and every one of us. So with that, thank you very much. And thank you again for all your support. So I think uh, we can start with the first, uh, first speaker, that is Professor Moji Hodai. Can, can, can I just start, uh, you introduce the speakers and then uh, we will start. Okay, I'm Professor Nair. Yes, Nair's yes, I, I, okay. yeah, okay. yeah, I'm going to so, do it. Uh, good yeah. morning, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to all my dear friends. And on behalf of my dear friend, Professor Yoko Kato, 
President of uh, ACNS Matron E. H. Cheng, retired Chief Matron, Department of Neurosurgery Hospital at Kale, and Miss Ann P. Kao, Chief Nurse of Nursing Department, Huachan Hospital, Fudan University at Shanghai. It is my distinct pleasure to be the commentator for today's second ACNS webinar. AC, ACNN webinar, I'm sorry, ACNN webinar. In today's session, we have two renowned speakers, invited speakers. And uh, uh, the first speaker is uh, Professor Mochkan Hodai. It's 5 a.m. in Toronto. She has woken up for her. She's all ready to give us a lecture. She's Professor of Neurosurgery at the Division of Neurosurgery at Toronto Western Hospital. She will be talking to us on syndrome of trigeminal neuralgia and his treatment. Professor Hodai, she is currently also a professor and surgical co-director at Josie and Toby Tanbom Gamma Knife Radio Surgery Unit at Toronto Western General Hospital. And her field of clinical expertise and research include neuromodulation for treatment of movement disorders and pain, and also the surgical treatment of trigeminal neuralgia. And our second speaker, the second speaker is uh, Professor Anila Darbar. She's uh, again a renowned faculty all over the globe. She's medical director and consultant neurosurgeon at Aga Khan University, Karachi. And she's also medical director at Mukhtar A. Sheikh Hospital, MASH, at Multan. And as I told, she is consultant neurosurgeon at MASH and Aga Khan University Hospital at Karachi. And she will be talking to us on uh, um, uh, the uh, neuroscience nursing role, tradition, and future. And to chair today's sessions, we have two renowned people, two renowned surgeons. Uh, they don't require any introduction. One is my very close friend, Professor K.K. Turin. He is, uh, if I introduce him, it is just taking coal to Newcastle. If, if you still know, there is no person in the neurosurgical field who doesn't know K.K. Turin. He has put his uh, footprints everywhere in every subspeciality of neurosurgery. But I have to introduce him. He's the managing trustee. Mumbai Institute of Neuroscience, Chairman of the WFNS Committee on Complications in Neurosurgery. He's the past President Neurological Society of India, Bombay Neurosciences Association, Academia Eurasiana Neurosurgica, Asian Oceanian Skullbase Society. He's also the consultant neurosurgeon and Chairman Emeritus Department of Neurosurgery at Bombay Hospital in Mumbai, and he is specialized in this uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia. I know he has operated more than 1,000 cases, and one of the first persons who told that it is not arterial compression, but veins also is could be a culprit for trigeminal neuralgia. And he will be moderating, hopefully, the session on trigeminal neuralgia. And uh, the other esteemed uh, Esteemed professor is Professor Asmi Elias, again a good friend of ours from Kale. He is head and senior consultant neurosurgeon, Department of Neurosurgery at Tungu Abdul Rahman Neuroscience Institute at Kale. And also is a renowned pediatric neurosurgeon. He is working again in women and children hospitals at Kale. So just a brief description about the first talk before I hand over to the uh, the chairperson is Professor K.K. Turel and Asmi Elias. Trigeminal neuralgia is the topic which uh, Professor Hodai is going to give us uh, her lecture. Trigeminal neuralgia, also known as stick dolorex, is sometimes described as the most excruciating pain known to humanity. Pain typically involves the lower jaw and face, although sometimes it affects the area around the nose and above the eye. The Indian stabbing, electric shock like pain caused by irritation of the trigeminal nerve. We sense branches to the forehead, cheek, and lower jaw, but usually it's limited to one side of the face. Pain can be triggered by actions as routine and minor as brushing teeth, eating, or the just a blow of wind. And attacks may begin mild and short, but if left untreated, it can be devastating. And it is reported that. Around 150,000 people are diagnosed with trigeminal neuralgia every year. 
and in the National Institute of Neurological Disorders, NINCH, notes that trigeminal neuralgia is twice as common in women than men. And all of us know there are two types of trigeminal neuralgia, primary and secondary. The exact cause of trigeminal neuralgia is still unknown, but the pain associated with it represents an irritation of the nerve. And primary trigeminal neuralgia has been linked to the compression of the nerve, typically at the root entry zone of trigeminal nerve by a healthy artery or vein. And this places pressure on the nerve as it tenders the brain and produces aphatic transmission. But of course, we know that secondary trigeminal neuralgia is caused by pressure on the nerve root from a tumor or even from multiple sclerosis. And there are um, hunting treatments available, including uh, medical treatment, and in which it is mostly anticonvulsive. But there are some first line treatment like surgery, neuromodulation, which Professor Hodai will talk. And I am handing over my mic to the chairperson, Professor Keki Turel, and ask me, Alias, for continuing this. Thank you very Professor much. Keki. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have to make any my remarks or shall we go straight to the... I think so. We can go straight. Okay. Yeah, because I think you have already spoken everything. And in the interest of saving time, we will like to listen to what she has to say. And then we can put in our remarks. Yeah. So, uh, Very good. So I will start sharing my screen. I okay. hope you can see it. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> All right, uh, good morning, afternoon and evening to everyone. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to be here with you and to meet you even though virtually and to speak about the syndrome of trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, I bring you greetings uh, from Canada to all of the participants in the webinar and thank you so much Maitreyi, Yi for inviting me and uh, to be able to share this uh, morning with our dear nurses. Uh, so, it's been alluded to already, Dr. Nair, thank you so much for your very kind introduction on the topic of trigeminal neuralgia. This is a very severe form of facial neuropathic pain, which is often thought to be the result of compression of the trigeminal nerve by, by an adjacent arterial loop. And it's a great source of distress to patients. First of all, the pain is extremely severe, it's electrical in nature, and it's also the result of uh, very mild sensory stimuli, so things that we're not particularly um, aware of uh, uh, inducing this type of pain suddenly result in this surge of, uh, of electrical pain. So just gently touching the wind, uh, the face, a brush of wind, or brushing one's teeth. So uh, within all the different pain syndromes, trigeminal neuralgia is rather stereotypical, meaning that from one patient to the next, there's quite a lot of commonalities. It's characterized by this lancinating pain in the divisions of the trigeminal nerve. So uh, for the purposes of illustrating the uh, type of pain, imagine, uh, for instance, how this would compare to the pain that patients suffer from sciatica, which is relatively stereotypical, but uh, a lot more idiosyncratic than trigeminal neuralgia. The lancinating pain is very, very common in these patients, is overwhelmingly unilateral, commonly affecting the lower branches compared uh, to uh, the forehead. Importantly, uh, there's uh, generally no pain in between attacks and no sensory disturbances. So this means that patients are perfectly fine and suddenly they'll have a, a, a severe attack which can be rather debilitating. And the, the words that patients have used to describe this attack are quite intense. But then that pain uh, typically goes away and the patient comes down to pain of zero as well until the next attack occurs. Occasionally, patients that are in extremis or experiences trigeminal neuralgia crisis, then they have you know, very fre frequent attacks back to back. Uh, but that is uh, uh, not commonly seen, thankfully. Importantly, patients respond very well to medications that are anti-epileptics or anticonvulsant medications such as carbamazepine and very poorly to opiates. And this is, of course, something that is very common for a neuropathic type of pain compared to nociceptive pain. Uh, the, uh, the way we think trigeminal neuralgia starts 
is based on aberrant signal transmission in the trigeminal nerve and the so-called ignition hypothesis. Uh, so the process is thought to be that there's a blood vessel that is very close, generally arterial, potentially venous, uh, very close to the nerve. And uh, obviously that does not occur um, such that there's contact and suddenly there's pain. That contact remains for, for some time and slowly that can start in uh, the generation of areas of focal demyelination in the nerve, uh, typically at the point of greatest contact or compression. And these areas of focal demyelination can result in this ignition uh, and um, aberrant signal transmission within uh, the nerve. So based on this, we feel that microvascular decompression is generally the preferred surgical treatment for these patients. So this uh, panel illustrates the type of contact that a nerve and a blood vessel can have. You can see that in general, uh, the blood vessel and commonly the superior cerebellar artery is in proximity of the trigeminal nerve, but it can become in contact with the nerve. It can compress the nerve or it can frankly distort the nerve. So this is important to uh, note as to to what degree uh, this level of contact can occur, but importantly, the severity of pain is not dependent on the type of contact, such that patients that have distortion of the nerve don't necessarily have more pain than the general neurology of patients in whom you just see contact between the vessel and the nerve. So this is actually uh, a key point and the point that flagged, uh, uh, that I flagged for the purposes of how we study trigeminal nerve as well. And hopefully I'll get, I'll have a minute to discuss this uh, later on. So this is what I mentioned earlier, the uh, areas of uh, focal demyelination that can occur within the nerve as a consequence of ongoing compression. And uh, this um, uh, results in uh, decompression uh, allowing for rapid recovery of normal conduction, which results in uh, relief of pain. So it's worth noting for a few minutes uh, that trigeminal neuralgia fits within the context of what we call hyperactive cranial nerve disorders. And these are pain syndromes that are associated with uh, the, uh, all the cranial nerves, but particularly with the cranial nerves and trigeminal neurology is just one of them, is, uh, is part of a number of conditions associated with the nerve. In terms of the hyperactive cranial nerve disorders, these are of course very interesting because obviously <clears throat> within the context of the nervous system, we know that any level of compression or distortion if it's in the central nervous system results in a negative uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, whereas if it's associated with the cranial nerves, it results in hyperactive phenomena. So within the trigeminal nerve, we have the lancinating facial pain of trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, cranial nerve seven can result in hemifacial spasm. Uh, cranial nerve eight can result in tinnitus. And even so lower down, for instance, a compression of the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, can result, uh, can result in hiccups, intractable hiccups, and I've operated on these cases. Uh, having said that, as we go down in the brainstem anatomically, the likelihood of these syndromes decreases. So the most common syndrome is trigeminal neuralgia, and there's a decreased incidence of the ones that I have listed here. And as I mentioned, within the trigeminal pain syndromes, trigeminal neuralgia is just one of them. We have uh, other syndromes. Patients with multiple sclerosis can have uh, multiple sclerosis uh, type of trigeminal neuralgia, which in most cases is a very similar type of pain, but it can differ. Uh, there can be patients with trigeminal neuropathic pain as a result of uh, either tumor or some level of injury to, the cranial, to this uh, nerve in, in the CP angle. Uh, there can be deafferentation of the trigeminal nerve and also post-herpetic neuralgia amongst other pains. So there are some differences into uh, these syndromes. Uh, obviously, the etiology difference, that's very important, but at the same time, the potential type of sensory loss, the triggers for pain and so on are different. 
So this is an MRI axial view that illustrates the, uh, the level of compression. You can see the, I hope you can see my mouse. You can see the trigeminal nerve coursing in the cistern on the left side unimpeded. And you can see that on the right side, it can barely be distinguished. And instead we have these two dots, which of course is the loop of blood vessel that is essentially digging into the trigeminal nerve and compressing it. So it's very interesting to think of this syndrome and why is it that we have patients with trigeminal neuralgia. The, there was an article in 2009 by Kim Birchall's group uh, and Jonathan Miller being as the first first author that looked into many aspects of uh, this level of neurovascular compression. And looking at patients that don't have pain, we see neurovascular compression in almost 20% of patients. When patients do have trigeminal neuralgia, uh, there is compression of the nerve in about roughly 60% of patients. So not everybody, about 40% of patients don't really have much of trigeminal neuralgia. Now we could say that this article is from 2009, maybe the quality of imaging was different. Of course, that's a possibility, but nonetheless, uh, we still see that, that patients don't always have compression of the trigeminal nerve on imaging. And also make note of this, that about 40% or so of patients Ha that have trigeminal neuralgia also have evidence of bilateral compression, but their pain is uniformly on one side only. So again, hold on, hold on to this with another clue, another part of this mystery of, of this syndrome. We can also have patients uh, that can have a trigeminal neuralgia secondary to tumors. So for instance, this patient has a cerebral pontine angle tumor, the trigeminal nerve is very much squeezed and instead of presenting with uh, um, other syndromes, the chief presentation was that of pain uh, relating to the trigeminal nerve. So it, this uh, imparts the importance of imaging in uh, this condition. And I've talked briefly about multiple sclerosis uh, induced trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, these uh, patients generally do not benefit from, from microvascular decompression since the Etiology of the pain is uh, typically not uh, neurovascular compression. Uh, we often treat these patients with uh, gamma knife radiosurgery or rhizotomy as initial procedures. And oftentimes if patients have a high plaque burden, um, this pain can be rather difficult to treat. And, and a key group of patients are patients that have dull coctatic basilar uh, loops that compress the trigeminal nerves. These can present an additional challenge, definitely a surgical challenge to uh, treat these patients with microvascular decompression. Uh, and uh, other procedures such as gamma knife and um, uh, rhizotomy are definitely an option for these patients. But in my view, they recur frequently uh, with respect to the severity of their pain. So it's typically observed that procedures that are more central uh, oftentimes work uh, longer and have a lower risk of recurrence than procedures that are peripheral. So let's review these. We have obviously the root entry zone, which is uh, at, uh, sorry, the microscopic decompression that occurs at the root entry zone. Uh, from there, we can move on to the cisternal segment where we uh, plant the dose for radiosurgery. Uh, then we have uh, rhizotomies, which is directed at the ganglion, at the cassiterian ganglion. And then we can go and section branches uh, at the uh, most uh, peripheral portion. And uh, again, as we move towards the, the central aspects of uh, uh, the nerve, then the likelihood of the procedure working or having longer term effectiveness is higher. I put central uh, procedures such as neuromodulation really separate because their mechanism of action is different and the way we do the procedure is entirely different, but they are of course to be noted as well. Again, this is another view showing the uh, uh, points of approach, either at the root entry zone at the uh, um, and where the microvascular uh, decompression, as well as uh, uh, radiosurgery and rhizotomy work. So again, the microvascular decompression is directed to the root entry zone 
gamenoid reduced surgery is directed to the cisternal segment and rhizotomy uh, um, aims for uh, the ganglion and its preganglionic branches. So uh, just a brief overview of the anatomy of the posterior fossa. Uh, we see again the position, I hope you can see my mouse, the position of the pons, very important uh, key area of the brainstem and uh, the uh, position of the trigeminal nerves that exit laterally from the pons and head into the Meckel's cave, the cavernous sinus, and eventually exit uh, the skull. For the purposes of microvascular decompression, we perform a small craniotomy, which is mapped to the position of the transverse and sigmoid uh, sinuses. I prefer a craniotomy over a craniectomy uh, with opening of the dura and dynamic gentle retraction of the cerebellum. Uh, in uh, my um, hands, uh, this um, opening is rather uh, small. And again, with gentle retraction, we uh, get quite a lot of relaxation of the cerebellum. I don't um, open the cisternal magna, that's not necessary, and I generally do not use mannitol uh, or uh, lumbar drains as form of relaxation. Uh, with uh, a little bit of patience, there's good CSF egress and the uh, uh, cerebellum relaxes. Uh, one needs to pay special attention to the petrosal vein, which is always very close to the trigeminal nerve. And uh, it uh, uh, is best preserved as uh, a um, vascular structure uh, that may potentially represent a point of uh, deep cerebellar uh, drainage and therefore uh, best not to take the vein unless absolutely necessary. The arachnoid surrounding the trigeminal nerve uh, needs to uh, be released. And oftentimes, actually there's always a cuff of arachnoid that holds the superior petrosal vein and uh, sort of tugs on it as the cerebellum is retracted. So that needs to be uh, um, identified and uh, duly addressed. And of course, after at that point, there's uh, adequate identification of the neurovascular complex. I uh, look at all the corners of the nerve to make sure that there's no hidden vessel that is not visible. And importantly, I make sure that the nerve entry zone is adequately decompressed. So you can have a view here of roughly what the size of this craniotomy is, and it can be compared with the size of the ear. And again, if the sigmoid and transverse uh, um, sinuses uh, are mapped, the incision is uh, somewhere like so, allowing for uh, the burr hole to be positioned very close to the junction. And the craniotomy really is uh, roughly the size of um, of a Canadian quarter, uh, which is not, uh, not very large. And within uh, a microscopic view, then one is able to see the trigeminal nerve, the compressing artery, and uh, importantly, a set of arachnoid bands that oftentimes tug on the uh, trigeminal nerve and hold the proximity between it and the vascular structure closely. And uh, these bands, of course, need to be released. And in my view, they have a significant level of contribution to uh, the expression of uh, the pain in trigeminal uh, neurology. So here I have uh, a brief uh, video uh, for you of uh, a decompression. This is a, uh, a view uh, within uh, the microscope. I hope you can see it okay. You can see the white uh, structure, which is a Teflon patty that's about one centimeter, the trigeminal nerve uh, uh, here, cranial nerve seven and eight to the side. And again, uh, the nerve is distorted because of the blood vessel that's right under it. And it is now free. Uh, that uh, vascular structure is, not pulled is now pulled over. And despite obviously the fact that the nerve is decompressed, uh, I uh, still put the Teflon piece to make sure that the contacts between the nerve and the blood vessel are eliminated and that the nerve is free. And this uh, completes the decompression procedure. So within a, uh, for the procedure of rhizotomy, we do this as a day procedure under sedation. Uh, it's a per percutaneous procedure, uh, as I mentioned, and we identify the position of the trigeminal nerve using intraoperative fluoroscopy. 
Uh, I also use intraoperative neurostimulation to identify the branches uh, that we are on. Uh, the technical considerations are, uh, as I said, um, fluoroscopy is mandatory. It, it's uh, frankly not doable without it or not advisable to do without it. Um, it's possible to add a CT neuronavigation for the identification of Fermi that is helpful as well, but does not take away the role of fluoroscope. One can inject kind of contrast material to ensure that we have reached the position of uh, Meckel's cave. Um, and as I mentioned, intraoperative simulation is helpful as well to identify the branches. I generally use uh, 0.35 to 0.4 cc's of glycerol that is injected in upright position. And if it's uh, um, radio frequency, generally 75 uh, Celsius for approximately 80 to 90 seconds with an earlier test lesioning at lower temperatures. One needs to be very careful about the possibility of corneal anesthesia. And therefore, if patients have V1 pain, I do not use rhizotomy for those patients. So this is a fluoroscopic view and you can see the approach of the needle. And the way to find the landmark is the position of the clivus and the line of the petrous bone. And this creates a V, as you can see right here. And that should be the position of, of uh, direction of the needle aiming for the mid pupillary line on the X plane. And this is uh, us using a, fl a fluoroscope combined with CT neuronavigation, which can be done in a non-invasive manner and just mapped to uh, the patient as they are under sedation. And this allows us to pick the point of uh, the trigeminal uh, nerve at the foramen ovale and helps at least with the initial guidance. And that's uh, um, ideal to uh, approach perhaps faster and also use less uh, radiation. So generally this procedure is fast acting. Numbness is of course the most common side effect. We want to induce numbness. Generally the numbness is milder with glycerol and higher with uh, radio frequency. Very important to check for corneal reflex after the procedure. Uh, the loss of this reflex is potentially dangerous and uh, needs adequate, uh, patients need adequate information and postoperative care. Uh, branch neurectomy is uh, done uh, infrequently. All three branches can be sectioned. Uh, uh, the first branch can be sectioned at the supraorbital notch incision, with an incision above the eyebrow. The second one just below uh, the orbit. And the third one, the sectioning of the inferior alveolar nerve can be done uh, through an incision along the angle of the jaw, but noting that this nerve actually runs through a bony canal. So the bone along the angle of the jaw needs to be drilled until we approach uh, this nerve. This is a sectioning of a supraorbital nerve. You can see the position of the eye and you can see the eyelashes here, the eyebrow is here. We've made a small incision and I'm holding that uh, V1 branch in a hook and then it will be cut in as long a segment as possible to minimize the risk of it regenerating. So again, this shows the position of all three branches as they come to the face and where a peripheral neurectomy can be, uh, can be performed. So what are the advantages of each of these techniques? Well, microvascular decompression by far provides the highest rate of long-term benefit. Generally, 90% of patients are pain-free upfront, 75% at five years, allowing for some risk of recurrence. Not ideal in the setting of medical comorbidities, of course, or patients that, that have significant um, uh, advanced age and so on. Although I find that actually with advanced age procedures, microvascular decompression is technically quite a lot easier. The cerebellum relaxes a lot easier, but the patients take longer to recover. Rhizotomy uh, provides fast and quick relief, high likelihood of facial numbness. Uh, the key for this procedure is to tailor numbness to the affected division. And as I mentioned, it's not an ideal procedure if the patients have V1 pain. And I want to also share with you a few words about gamma knife radiosurgery, a very important procedure for the treatment of trigeminal neuralgia. This, for, this uh, treatment was developed in the 1950s by, the, by a neurosurgeon from Sweden, Dr. Lars Lexell, who coined the, the term radiosurgery to uh, define the delivery of radiation in a single fraction uh, to uh, somewhere in the brain, um, 
by uh, using cross-firing or ionizing uh, radiation at uh, that target. There's multiple beams of gamma rays that meet at the target, and that's why it's called a gamma knife. And uh, this procedure is important because it's non-invasive, it's a day procedure. It's ideal because it really does not have uh, you know, too many uh, issues with anesthesia and so on, makes, uh, and this makes the procedure really helpful for patients that have a lot of medical comorbidities or on blood thinners. It carries a low risk of corneal numbness or facial numbness. Uh, of course, not zero, but low risk. And uh, uh, the benefit profile is that of delayed uh, relief. So patients that are very, very um, dis uh, debilitated with this pain, maybe gamma knife is not the best approach considering that it takes about four weeks or so for it to work. And there's a limitation in terms of how many times we can do gamma knife radio surgery because of course the radiation dose to the brain is cumulative. Generally, we keep it at two very uh, few instances do we actually go to a third at gamma knife radio surgery treatment. Uh, but again, we don't want this cumulative dose to result in necrosis of the nerve and potentially result in longer problems down the line. Uh, so as I mentioned, the pain uh, relief onsets about three to four weeks, occasionally early, um, and the numbness is uncommon and importantly, it's delayed. So for gamma knife patients uh, have a frame that is placed onto their head and beyond that, they lie in the machine uh, after the plan has been made and uh, the treatment plan ranges anywhere between 30, to, uh, 30 minutes to one hour. Uh, they're awake, they listen to music, and uh, after that, they are good. They're just uh, watched for about an hour to make sure that they uh, recover well, uh, and uh, they go home that same day. You can see this patient uh, that is undergoing frame placement, and uh, uh, this is done under local anesthesia. Generally, sedation is not required. So when the head is placed in a syrtactic frame, it allows us to identify the position of these fiducial markers that I point to. And based on that, we are able to construct and place every bit of uh, the stuff within the frame, therefore the brain, within a syrtactic space. And it will uh, then receive uh, directions, an X, Y, Z point that identifies each, each of these spots and we're able to uh, map and uh, plan a delivery of radiation to them. So you see in this instance that we've mapped the position of the trigeminal nerve and uh, the brainstem and we uh, construct and plan the shot that we then uh, uh, deliver to these patients as they lie, lie down. And this is similar uh, in some ways and different from uh, delivery of radiation uh, with gamma knife to other structures in the brain. Uh, the similarities, of course, the frame and the, the pattern of uh, dose definition. And the difference is, is that for functional neurosurgery conditions, we identify a single point in space, a single X, Y, Z point in space. Whereas for tumors such as this, we identify a volume. So the, the dose is constructed slightly differently. But nonetheless, the same uh, principles hold. A few words about trigeminal neuralgia related to multiple sclerosis. Uh, as I mentioned, these patients are primarily treated uh, with either rhizotomy or gamma knife and rarely with microvascular decompression. Microvascular de decompression can provi provide benefit to this group, but the key thing is that the pattern of um, uh, benefit of patients with MS is very unpredictable. So they might wake up from surgery and say, oh, I'm really good and in a couple of weeks have pain again. And uh, sometimes they have you know, much lo longer um, uh, relief. So this uh, makes it very difficult to have a good conversation with the patient and uh, propose microvascular decompression. And one also um, needs to be aware of the um, uh, risk of, um, uh, that brings to the patients who have uh, advanced, microvas uh, advanced MS and uh, uh, how they might recover from an intracranial procedure. And again, this, this uh, illustrates the potential plaque burden in a patient with MS. And uh, sometimes uh, there's a high number of plaques supratentorially. Sometimes there's a high number of plaques infratentorially, and that does not directly affect the, the expression of pain. A couple of words about neuromodulation. 
uh, is reserved for cases that are unresponsive to other forms of treatment uh, or atypical uh, procedures. I generally um, use peripheral field uh, simulation um, and uh, very rarely now deep brain simulation. Peripheral field simulation is approached in a percutaneous manner. We advance the electrode uh, to the field in V1 or V2 territories or V3. Uh, it's done under general anesthesia purely because it's so uncomfortable for patients to feel it, but the procedure is actually rather uh, quick, but it takes about 10 minutes or so to place these electrodes under the skin, and then they get tested. Uh, so this illustrates, for instance, the placement of the electrodes in V1 and V2, and then these get tested for a bit, uh, time uh, line of roughly one week to see if it provides uh, relief or not. If it does provide relief, then uh, uh, new electrodes are put in and directly internalized and connected to a pulse generator. So uh, just briefly, uh, the, uh, this panel represents the type of procedures, uh, the likelihood of early pain relief and the likelihood of long-term pain relief from uh, these procedures. And um, very quickly, I wanted to tell you about some of the important research that we're doing in this area. I touched briefly on uh, the likelihood of neurovascular compression and how unusual it is for us, for instance, uh, that we see about 40% of patients with having bilateral trigeminal neuralgia. 20% of patients are asymptomatic, have, have uh, neurovascular compression. So who is at fault here? Is it the blood vessel or is it the nerve? And in my view, uh, we have up to very recently focused on the blood vessel because we have such difficulty imaging the nerve itself and what might be the difficulties or the, the abnormalities within the nerve. But in fact, as research has advanced in this area, particularly in the last 10 years in my lab, we have focused on studying the nerve instead and uh, really shifting the paradigm of our approach to understanding of this condition uh, by studying uh, both nerve-related ch changes as well as brain changes in, this, uh, in, in these patients and understanding what happens at the level of gray matter or the level of white matter at the level of the nerve to both predict the syndrome and also predict uh, the pain and its relief. So in doing this uh, uh, and in using uh, uh, microstructural uh, studies of the trigeminal nerve using tractography, we can document the changes within the nerve itself, for instance, when gamma knife is uh, used as a form of treatment and use uh, diffusion tensor imaging to study different portions of uh, the nerve as well. And importantly, focus on studying uh, the brain and what are the changes at the level of the brain when patients have uh, these conditions? And this uses uh, this technique, for instance, that I show you here is uh, uh, studying um, cortical uh, uh, thickness in all aspects of uh, the areas um, uh, that are connected to the trigeminal nerve. And by doing this, we tessellate the brain. So you can see that we take the images and break it down into the smallest geograph. Uh, ge um, geometric uh, uh, figures so that we keep uh, a distinction of where the gyri and sulci are and are able to measure the thickness of all of these areas. And in doing this, we've been able to actually come up with predictors of a relief uh, for patients and uh, what results uh, in adequate relief uh, uh, for some and how is that linked to neuroanatomical changes. So we see, for instance, that patients that are good responders to gamma knife radio surgery, uh, generally at a pretreatment level, have uh, micro di microstructural diffusivity changes that are restricted to the cisternal segment, whereas those that are non-responders, the change occurs within the brainstem, suggesting that the patient that as the pain becomes centralized, there is a less likelihood of peripheral procedures uh, helping it. So the near future of trigeminal neuralgia research really, uh, in my view, we've relied uh, on purely clinical data for a very long time, and it's time to change that. Uh, we uh, focus on uh, studies that are very individualized, that study the patient's MRI to make decisions. And we hope that this takes us to a point of precision medicine and individual analysis, and that one day we're able to go from that initial chart that I showed you and us just distinguishing these pain syndromes based on clinical aspects alone 
to really using uh, imaging as an important adjunct and not having clinical criteria as a sole identifier of uh, these syndromes. So I want to thank all of you again for um, participating in this seminar. It really is a pleasure to uh, be here with you and I look forward to your thoughts. Thank you again. Thank you, Professor Hodai. I will ask uh, Professor KT Turel to lead the discussion now. Okay, thank you very much. That was very instructive, Mojgan. Very simple and very nicely explained. As you very succinctly summarized in the last slide, one nerve and many varieties of pain uh, by different mechanisms and different etiological factors. Um, so it is, therefore it is very important to know um, the difference between uh, classical or typical trigeminal neuralgia and other types of pain. And what we call as typical pain and atypical pain. Sometimes I wish we had discussed a little bit on that atypical pain because um, very often patients are misguided uh, even by uh, referring doctors and by neurosurgeons uh, and neurologists uh, about the right type of treatment. And as you know, typical trigeminal will respond brilliantly to MBD, but atypical may not respond so well. Uh, and the other issue that you also touched upon was, um, yes, uh, apart from the cl uh, classical clinical presentation is uh, the, it is the uh, imaging, MRI. MRI is the gold standard because it distinguishes classic trigeminal from other types of pain. Um, and like including MS and other causes of pain. And it's very important to have, therefore, even if you are treating by a non-MBD procedure, by some ablative procedures, there are so many ablative procedures like uh, uh, chemical rhizotomy, uh, RFTC, balloon compression, a gamma knife, and even neurotomy. So all of these procedures, which you call as ablative procedures, they all result in numbness. And even if you're going to uh, use these procedures for the treatment, it's important to know what the, MBD, what the MRI shows. If the MRI, accordingly as the treatment will be uh, uh, presented to the patient. So classically for, again, I guess you rightly pointed out that uh, not always you are able to find out the cause of, uh, I mean, the etiological factor on MRI, but the classical fact classical um, uh, way to examine is uh, for arterial compression, we do a 3D T2-weighted or TOF MRA, as we have mentioned, and for veins, which I have been constantly talking about as an important causative factor, not just the arteries, veins also. And veins can be seen by very thin cuts, high resolution, uh, T1 post-contrast 3D sequences. They are the right uh, uh, pictures for uh, identification of veins. And uh, so veins are also not to be forgotten. And you must also not forget that in the same patient, you can have both arterial compression and venous compression. And you can have not one artery, but sometimes you can have two and three. I have operated on a patient with four vessel compression also. So it is it's possible. I mean, it is uh, very rare, but it is possible. So unless you completely look around the trigeminal nerve 360 degrees, you are liable to miss one or the other vessel and therefore the recurrence may be seen. Uh, talking about uh, uh, surgery, uh, uh, I, um, I don't know whether this is the right stage to talk about surgery and the nuances of surgery. <clears throat> uh, is it the correct thing to talk about surgery over here? Because it is, I think, mainly for the nurses. So do we talk anything about surgery? Uh, I think we can skip that, uh, KK. Yes, 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 yes. Because that is far too technical an issue for uh, from the surgical point. But for, but for the sake of uh, those uh, neurosurgeons who are uh, attending this uh, seminar, uh, we, I just want to make one comment. And that is the petrosal vein. We all know that we have to separate the nerve, the artery from the nerve the offending artery, which is superior cerebral or ICA or basilar, we separate them from the nerve. But there are sometimes veins. Uh, now, the commonest vein that is in closest proximity is the petrosal vein. And petrosal vein has also many variations. 
It is not just one vein. It can be two or three tributaries. And very often, they are just sitting right on top of the nerve. And very uh, annoying sometimes to move them out of the field in order to gain access to the nerve. Because they are sitting guarding that, you know, very possessively the nerve. And, <laughs> and therefore, to separate this vein from the uh, nerve is also very tricky. And I know that some neurosurgeons are impatient and they coagulate one or the other tributaries or sometimes the whole vein saying that, oh, well, in 95% or whatever percent they have, they have in their mind, uh, so many people do not have a problem. So we can coagulate and, and, and have an easy operation. I think uh, this is uh, doing injustice to the patient. Uh, because uh, you never know when you can land into serious trouble by sacrificing an important vein. And therefore, the, uh, the golden rule is, please try to preserve the vein to the fullest that you can, you can and do not sacrifice it. Otherwise, you find some other way to treat the patient. Because I do know that there can be catastrophe after coagulation of this vein, whether this vein is uh, done deliberately coagulated or accidentally coagulated, whatever it is. Uh, it should be, ideally speaking, not sacrificed. The, classically, we separate the artery from the nerve. And classically, the neurosurgeon puts a piece of Teflon between the two. And that is called interposition. But a good operation would be one where you are able to mobilize the whole artery and reposition it at some other place. And that's called transpositioning, which is possible with a long looping vessel like a superior cerebral artery. It may not be always possible uh, with uh, ICA because ICA has many perforating branches going to the brainstem and to the hearing apparatus and the facial nerve. So I would say that uh, transpositioning is a better way than interpositioning. Even long-term results are better when you have no Teflon then putting some interpositioning Teflon. So I think these are the few comments that I... Okay. Friends, KK, we'll ask Asmi. Yes. Do you want to pass some comments, Asmi? Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think I had a very wonderful lecture. I really enjoy it. Even as a neurosurgeon, I learned a lot. Uh, we have a dilemma uh, maybe uh, in your country like uh, 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 Canada. I think uh, a lot of people... I have a very good uh, understanding about the disease, but some part of the world, for example, uh, in Southeast Asia, sometimes uh, as you show that the most effective treatment uh, are surgery, yeah. But then when they talk about surgery, they are really afraid. They prefer to have some other, uh, you know, alternative. For example, like uh, even gamma knife, uh, you know, uh, red SRS, eh? because uh, there is no incision. Uh, but then uh, some of them have a recurrence. So this is a dilemma that you face, but you nicely put in one of your slides uh, which treatment actually effectively uh, use. Uh, uh, it depends on the uh, which level of the offending uh, problem, yeah, the, like a preglanconic and so on. I really enjoy it, but I just want to ask uh, 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 the, the speakers, uh, Prof. Khan, whether you 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 have a cases where patient uh, referred directly by the neurologist for gamma knifers. Yeah, uh, because patient either they don't want the surgery or they're afraid about the surgery or they're being influenced by the effectiveness of radio surgery. So, and then uh, how do you uh, come uh, overcome this issue? And uh, do you find uh, any potential, uh, you know, uh, effect eh, after the uh, radio surgery itself? Well, thank you very much. That's a very important point. Thanks for bringing that up. I'll tell you what your experience is for, at our institutions. Um, we get referrals from um, colleagues, from neurosurgeons, from neurologists, other specialties, and also from family doctors. <clears throat> Oftentimes, <clears throat> the patients come for with their referrals to general neurologia, and from then that point, we triage them when. Uh, they're triaged to gamma knife radio surgery. We discuss them at a multidisciplinary um, uh, level and also have a very frank discussion with the patient offering all options. It just so happens as the, uh, the same team doing the microvascular decompression as well as gamma knife rhizotomy. So they're not talking to different people. Often patients that are eligible for microvascular decompression are also eligible, of course, for gamma knife. 
And then they choose based on the practical purposes of their life. So for instance, they have small children, downtime from surgery and so on. It's not reasonable for them. They'll pick gamma knife. It's fine. And, you know, we, we provide them with that, with that uh, opportunity. And uh, if later on, a few years down the line, then they need uh, microvascular decompression, that's fine. It doesn't take away the risk. It doesn't make the procedure any more difficult. Uh, the reverse is true as well. Some people say, you know what, I want the most definitive uh, treatment up front, and therefore I prefer to have microvascular decompression. Uh, and that's perfectly reasonable. I rarely, very rarely offer rhizotomy as the first procedure. Uh, unless these are patients with MS or they have some level of um, uh, um, concern that does not make them eligible for microvascular decompression. Because even a small injury to the nerve, you know, it's not just that one episode that we're thinking, we're thinking about the many years ahead, how many times they might need to have this procedure repeated, the potential risk for anesthesia dolorosa or nerve injury. And therefore these are best um, optimized within a, within a team and in consideration of uh, the patient as a whole and um, uh, and their lives. Thank you. Okay, uh, yes, uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, can I ask one question before I pass on to the next speaker? Uh, can, say, can, can, I, can I ask, Shresh Nayu? Oh, please, please, yes, please. please, please. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Please, please, for the catcher, you go <laughs> ahead. I will thank you. Thank you, Moji. Thank you so much. Because there's so many nurses want to know because they are maybe I think has an interest about the positioning of the patient and also because as a nurse, scrubbing nurse, that they assist the surgery. So the recently the, in Japan, many of the institutes that we start the pure endoscopic the, the surgery and uh, almost uh, just uh, it, it will finish in uh, two hours. It's very less invasive for the patient, just a two centimeter incision. And also the most of the case, uh, this is transposition. So no, no more insertion because uh, insertion something is another, the next uh, trigeminal neurology. So I think uh, one is uh, when we do the endoscopic surgery, so we do not think about, about positioning. So I, I think uh, maybe that you can uh, maybe some answer uh, for the nurses. Another question is, uh, just you showed us the four pattern of the vessels. Uh, I think uh, uh, the pain itself is very intermittent. So I, I'm very wondering why so intermittent. So the sometimes very severe pain, but sometimes very brave. So I think uh, that but the vessel is always attach the nerve. So I, I think uh, maybe some aging or some uh, uh, just like uh, uh, some diabetes or some uh, hypertension or what is uh, the real cause of the, the uh, such kind of the uh, pain. And also uh, you showed us a very final part is uh, just prediction of the uh, uh, compression part. Uh, the you uh, research, very nice research. And the, the recently uh, our uh, institute, we, we start with the CFD, it, it, we can, uh, uh, estimate of the hot spot, hot spot that, that means is uh, just compressive part. So I think uh, uh, it's very important to, to show the patients some kind of the, uh, such a uh, compressive part the before surgery. So please, uh, if you have some uh, comment or Thank panic. you, Dr. Kata. Very, very important question. So the first question was patient positioning. I position the patients at park bench, uh, which requires no battery. Alert from low battery. <laughs> uh, and park bench position requires a support both anteriorly and posteriorly. The head is generally turned uh, to allow this uh, retrosigmoid part to be flat. And uh, very important that the surgical bed is uh, can rotate, and this will allow um, the incision to be small. And rather than the surgeon being in great discomfort moving, on top of the patient. Instead, the bed rotates and makes uh, the approach very simple. Um, I don't do these endoscopically, but the incision is rather small and the procedure takes, the technical aspect is generally about an hour and a half. So it's not very long, uh, um, but um, I'm actually very interested in endoscopic approaches. Your next question uh, was about why does this pain happen and why is it intermittent? 
Um, that's a really good question, Dr. Pato. I don't know that we have a perfect answer for it yet. I will say though that the, it's in keeping with these areas of focal demyelination and what a level of afferent sensory input allows them to uh, trigger. And instead of just sending that afferent input to the brain, it spreads laterally to other fibers and that's why it, it gets amplified. Nonetheless, that doesn't directly explain it, uh, its pure intermittent approach. Um, the, maybe if we had more time, I would tell you about some other uh, research that we're doing into studying the brain in patients with trigeminal neuralgia and to what degree the brain actually has an input in controlling this pain. So whether it's this sort of brain nerve brainstem interface that results in sort of managing this pain or holding it at bay, or whether there's other uh, levels of uh, symptom control, it's not uh, clear. And uh, the third question was uh, whether transposition alone or interposition. Well, I have to say, I, um, I think there's benefits to both. I have certainly done transposition alone, and then there's been uh, you know, some delayed scoring, and a few years down the line, I realized maybe I should have put something uh, there because when it comes to reoperation. But at the same time, I have also seen case, cases of Teflon granulomas that have occurred years after inserting uh, this material. It's not always inert. And in some patients, the granulomas are tiny. Uh, and in some patients, they're huge. And it, you know, once a granuloma forms and there's calcifications, it's so much more difficult to look after. So I think it's a field that we just need to pay more attention to. Uh, formerly, like 25 years ago or so, there used to be um, Dacron patches, which really calcify, and those, uh, you know, are not ideal. We moved from that to Teflon, but maybe Teflon is not the best thing to use. So it's something to keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, Professor Montian, it was a great lecture. And uh, before we conclude this session, just a couple of questions from my side. Uh, say, one is, what do you suggest for... Uh, uh, deafferentation pains, one of the most difficult things to treat. Do you have any of the neuromodulatory treatment for that? And second is, you know, rare complication of trigeminal you know, cardiac reflex. How often do you see this? Because this can disturb, because the BP can crash because of central stim vasodilatory stimulation. Your views on this, uh, Professor Hoda, it was a great lecture as always from your end. Thank you so much. So for patients that have uh, the affrontation type pain and neuromodulation, particularly peripheral field stimulation is now my most favorite approach. Uh, it allows us uh, to have an extracranial approach to this condition. It's very safe. It can be trialed. It's expensive, obviously, because the electrodes cost money, but oftentimes quite helpful to patients who then have some level of control in managing uh, the device and uh, uh, have uh, an improved um, uh, pain profile. Uh, with respect to uh, the trigeminal cardiac reflex, this is something that anesthesia needs to be well aware of. So we have had episodes of asystole, we have had severe bradycardia, we have had hypertension, we have had hypotension. So these are all possible. And again, it, uh, when we are on the nerve, anesthesia needs to be aware and uh, uh, be ready to monitor and intervene. And of course, if something were to happen, so for instance, patient goes bradycardic, we just stop for a couple of minutes, have that, uh, you know, normalize, and then we, we resume. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mojigan, for getting up early at 6 a.m. in Toronto. And thank you very much for... Uh, addressing us, a great lecture, as always, from your end. And thank you very much from my end and from Professor Kato's end. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you uh, more in future, at least I in person well. again. Thank you so okay. much. And now it's my distinct pleasure uh, to call uh, Professor Anila Darbar uh, to talk on neuroscience, uh, uh, neuroscience nursing role, tradition, and future. Before I hand over to the chairperson, a few uh, comments from my end, introduction to the topic, you know, the development of neuroscience nursing always paralleled both the development of the institution itself and the specialization of neuroscience nursing. And during the last four decades, 
Let us have established themselves as leaders within the institution and within the nursing profession. Neuroscience nursing was first reported as an observational practice under the tutelage of Sir Victor Alexander Holsby, a neurosurgeon at the world's first neurological institute, the National Hospital in Kings Square, London. All the women have always been considered caretakers of the sick and injured. They were rarely trained to provide specialized neurological or neurosurgical care. Dedicated neuroscience units represent a relatively new concept and the Walter E. It is credited with Walter E. Dandy is credited with opening of a three-bed specialized care for post-operative neurosurgical patients in 1923 at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Even though the concept of NICU came, nurses working there treated patients with disease processes other than with a neurological dysfunction. <laughs> and before the advent of CT scans, nursing care relied on close observation of patients and changes in their level of consciousness. And when reports of a decreased loss of level of consciousness were communicated to the physician, nurses were just instructed to give patient a pinch of manitol and level of consciousness was the single most important assessment parameter. NICU had no cardiac monitors, there were no invasive blood pressure monitoring, temperatures were measured with mercury filled thermometers, and blood pressure were measured with traditional swing manometers. The physical component of neuro nurse nursing was demanding those days, and there were no specialized uh, uh, equipments for the nurses to monitor the patient and nurses used to work eight hours a day, e day, evening or night shift. And lastly, dedicated neuroscience nurses see themselves as individuals who do not give up. They do not lose hope. They, this trait does not translate to inappropriate expectations for a cure in an otherwise hopeless situation. Rather, it translates to nurses who are willing to assist and family members who adapt to an often dramatically different role in life. And sometimes it means translating the hope of, for a cure into the hope for acceptance. A neuroscience nurse sees the possibilities and expression of hope rather than a patient who appears to be incapable of doing anything. And future advances in technology will be used to expand web-based neuroscience nursing to develop nursing standards of care based on evidence-based models and to continue to promote and support excellence in nursing care. With this small introduction to the topic, may I invite Professor Anila Darbar, I have already introduced her, uh, to give her lecture on neuroscience nursing role, tradition and future. Professor Anila, please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nair, for the uh, for the kind introduction. I am just going to share my screen right now. Uh, can everybody see the screen? Yes. Yes. I just want to make it uh, full screen, Anila. Full screen, yes. Uh, okay, hold on. I'm missing the edge over here. It should be at this corner, right there. Okay. Sorry, give me one second. I'm sorry, I just can't move this. Yes. Okay, I'm done. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Professor Kato, uh, for inviting me for the Asian Congress of Neurological Nurses webinar series. Uh, my topic today is neuroscience nursing, role, tradition, and future. This is, of course, a non-clinical topic. And uh, the reason I have chosen this topic uh, is because um, when um, I'll share you a little story um, about my interaction with the neuroscience nursing. Uh, so uh, I was trained in uh, upstate New York in Syracuse, and uh, I still remember very distinctly my first ever night when I was on call 
uh, as a neurosurgery resident, I was year one, I was very scared. Um, and uh, we used to take care of ICU as well, because uh, at that time, we did not have any ICU specialists. So the neurosurgery uh, residents used to take care of the ICU and the floor and everything. And they, we only used to have one nurse. And uh, I distinctly remember that that particular night when I was on call for the first time in my life, uh, of one of the patient in the ICU actually died. And, um, and uh, the reason he died was because um, of uh, uh, some issue with, with the blood pressure monitoring and things like that. But what I remember from my experience was that the, the nurse who was assigned with me, how she took charge because she knew that I was new and I did not understand, uh, you know, how patients die in the ICU and how to take care of ones emotionally in such situations. Uh, and how she guided me um, uh, to take care of the patient, how to take care of the family, how to uh, inform, um, uh, uh, you know, the hospital staff and everything. And that made me think that how important it is for uh, nursing, for neuroscience nursing institute to develop because only a very trained neuroscience nursing would have the understanding of what was happening and how to deal with it. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to start my presentation. So a little bit about the history, as we all know that Florence Nightingale was the founder of the modern nursing and she was called the Lady of the Lamp and was in St. Thomas Hospital. And we still celebrate uh, the International Nurses Day on her birthday. And a little bit of history that uh, of, uh, of uh, neuroscience nursing already alluded a little bit by Dr. Nair was then in 1870 was marked as the first report of neurological nursing by Sir Victor Horsley, uh, who invited nurses to observe neurosurgery uh, to better take care of the hospital. And then the National Hospital in Queen Square also was become recognized for neurosurgical care by the help of neuroscience nursing. At the same time, Dr. Charcot was doing the same thing uh, in Paris. And in, at that time, most of the education was, of course, a non-formal and informal education. And it used to be that the physician or the neurosurgeon or the neurologist would uh, actually um, uh, tell the nurses what to do and, and teach the nurses. There was no dedicated curriculum at that time. And also the neuroscience was a part of... Uh, um, both neurology, neurosurgery, and psychiatry were intertwined as a mind and brain unit at that time, which, which I found uh, later on dispersed. And now, again, at this point in time, all the neurosciences are back again combining together. But at that time, Dr. Charles Mills was the one who actually wrote a book about neuroscience nursing of neurology and insane, which means that psychiatry was almost considered a part of neurosurgery in those days. And as neuro neurosurgery and neurology developed, it became clearer that we need to train more uh, nurses who are specialized for neuroscience and neurosurgery. And uh, at that time, United States became the, the first uh, uh, country to start um, formalized education and formalized training. Now, as you know that, uh, I, I mean, even in the medical school, I remember that, uh, uh, you know, there were people who liked neurosciences and then there were people who did not like neurosciences. And, uh, and the people who did not like didn't even bother to understand neurosciences. And I wonder if it's the same with the nurses as well. So a general nurse cannot do neurosurgery or neurology because there's a lot of lack in the interest over there. And, uh, and therefore the need of uh, neurosciences training uh, emerged. And of course, as I said, in the US first, and Amy Hillard became the first superintendent of nursing in 1910 and organized the first postgraduate course uh, in neuroscience nursing. And uh, um, in 1923, Dr. Dandy, who first, uh, who um, was uh, a protege of Dr. Harvey Cushing, who's considered as the father of neurosurgery, 
opened the first specialized care unit for post-operative neurosurgery at John Hopkins in Baltimore. And then at that time, the real neurosurgical nursing, nursing took root and this, uh, within the speciality of neurology and neurosurgery. So what was a so this was a little bit about the history of how uh, the uh, the neuroscience and uh, nursing developed, and initially uh, the neuroscience nursing was also a very traditional role, and mostly it was uh, the care they are the care providers, and in the World War II, a lot of um, uh, nursing developed when people had a lot of spine and head injury in the world wars. And at that time, they were nuns and they were military uh, personnel who actually were then at that time trained uh, to uh, start taking care of patients with neurological problems. Um, and at that time, there were also churches who were actually sponsoring uh, nurses uh, to work in these uh, war front zones. And uh, so that also emerged uh, another generation of uh, nurses who were interested in taking care of uh, brain injury and spine injury, et cetera. And when we talk about uh, neuroscience nursing and in general nursing, uh, there are, I feel that the patients, the, the, the most important thing is actually the care and the compassion. And there are some nurses who just get it right. And then there's some nurses who just don't get it right. So uh, there are patients who would be complaining that, oh, my bed is soiled, it hasn't been changed. I have leaky catheter, I have IV fluids that's not working. I have a high fever and my sheets are never straightened out. Uh, my cannula is not replaced or um, who is gonna take the, the blood sample, the phlebotomist or the nursing. And, uh, and all these struggles about uh, uh, the roles also of a phlebotomy, a nursing, a, 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 a care provider, all sort of were actually in silos. And uh, what is more important was that, that all these roles need to be combined. And I feel the nurse who actually combines all these roles together uh, doesn't care that, oh, um, I cannot take a blood sample because, you know, phlebotomist will do it, or I will not change the sheet because it's the work of a, a junior nursing staff uh, to do, to change the sheets, et cetera, makes people work in silos. So what I feel that when you develop up any kind of nursing institute, whether it's a neurosciences nursing institute or any kind of nursing institute, the first thing that needs to be incorporated as an idea for a, um, a, a junior nurse when they are doing their BSN course is the idea that no work is beneath you. And anything should be, uh, it should be okay to do it. Of course, the work are divided if you are, um, uh, if you're very busy, but nothing should be beneath it. And uh, I hope that uh, the, uh, uh, the new uh, no, no, BSN nursing, the first basic course they did, I hope the nursing school are actually inculcating this idea into nursing. Certainly at uh, Mukhtari Sheikh Hospital in Multan, we just starting our own nursing school this year. And for me, this idea of uh, that nothing is beneath you. And the most important role of a nurse is care and compassion is something that uh, I, along with as a medical director, along with the Dean of Nursing are inculcating into these, uh, the junior nursing staff, so that when they grow up, they also sort of get this information disseminated out to other nursing students. As I said, the core problem is becomes when people actually work in silos, and that is a, something that the whole system needs to be uh, changed in. And of course, it's a cultural change, it's a mindset change. But as I said, that some nurses get it right. And um, these are some of the, uh, the sentences that the, I've heard from the patients saying that, oh, my nurse took care of me so much that I would be lost for words or my nurse was an angel and a shining star, or she took extra time out of a shift to comfort me, or she went out of her way to, to take care of my home stuff and without them, I wouldn't survive. 
So uh, again, um, there are some nurses who get it right, some don't, and the persons don't. And uh, what I'm trying to uh, uh, inculcate the idea into the junior nursing who are actually listening uh, to this lecture is that, uh, that do not work in silos, work together. And the most important thing would be for uh, that your patient should always come first. Now, what happens, there was the, the traditional roles of the nursing was as an assistant to a doctor, uh, a care provider to the patient. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, sometimes the military and the, the nuns who were working for it. Nowadays, the roles are completely changing in, in nursing staff. So like as in doctors, you know, when you complete your MBBS or MD or whichever degree you take, there is a clinical field to go. And then there is also a non-clinical field to go, right? Not every doctor wants to practice medicine. Some go into administration, some go into entrepreneurship, some go into innovation. Similarly, when you have completed your basic BSN degree in, your, in, in nursing, not everybody would actually just want to become a general care provider or a nurse. And these days, the good thing is that if there is someone who wants to choose a specialized role of nursing as a, uh, as a care provider, in the, there are so many options available. I personally think that a hospital cannot run without these specialized nurses in this day and age. The nurses are the face of the hospital. The doctors are there to see their patients only for five or 10 minutes, but these nurses are the one who are there 24 seven and are the face of a hospital. And if you have specialized nursing, better it is. Uh, and these days, uh, a nurse can choose to be a palliative care nurse. And as you know, there are women who have written beautiful books about uh, palliative care nursing and how their experiences have been with the dying people and what their wishes have been. There are nurses who are actually taking care of stoma. Uh, there are mastectomy care nurses. There are chronic disease management and pain management nurses. There's also nurses who can do simple minor injury treatment in, a, in an acute care setting. Physician assistance is a very, very common phenomena in being a nursing specialist. These physician assistants can work not only with just the doctors, they are along with the hospitalists. They can also be physician assistant in a private prayer setting with a neurosurgeon, uh, with neurologist. Uh, if you are, um, uh, if there is uh, some, so in, in neurology, there is also a lot of Parkinson's disease and stimulators are placed and some of these nurses are also taking care of setting up those devices. Um, uh, so uh, there are, the roles are what I feel that from the traditional roles these days, the roles are completely different. Then there is research, which is a huge um, a field that the nurses can go in because um, grants are written, which are sometimes not only just multi-centered, but in fact, multi-country grants are there. And these are these nurses actually help in um, uh, doing the, the double blind studies, collecting the data, uh, contacting the patient. So there's, there's another role that a nurse can also fit in. Dialysis is also, also one of uh, uh, a very specialized role of nursing. So what I wanted to give the idea to the nursing students who are listening is that uh, not all nurses can be just simple care providers or just a nursing role, but you can also actually go into very, very specialized field, become a um, specialist of that area and that uh, not only increases your, uh, you move ahead in your career, but it is also, um, it gives you an edge, uh, both financially and as career-wise, uh, to, to do something different. Uh, however, when you, um, uh, when you specialize, I feel there are some challenges that are there. Uh, one challenge is that uh, you lose the role of traditional care 
of a nurse, which is a typical nurse, because again, you have so many patients to deal with. You, you always tell the patient that, oh, my role is only this and my role is not that. And again, the silo starts to happen. Although there's an increase in the clinical knowledge, there's increase in the, the technical skills, uh, there is increase in the treatment coordination, increase in vigilance to identify patients who are deviating from the expected trajectory. But what I feel sometimes that the compassion and general compassion and the care actually gets lost sometimes. It of course doesn't happen to everything. I'm just saying that this, this is one of the challenges that I have noticed in specialized nursing care. Another challenge that I have noticed when you go to a specialized nursing care is that many countries grossly underinvest in nursing training. And uh, when they not only they underinvest, but they also are unable to retain them. Now, this is a problem that I see in third world countries like Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, is that the biggest challenge that happens is they are very underpaid not only underpaid, but underappreciated as well. Uh, the, 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 uh, still, the concept that the nurses are lower than doctors are still persist in third world countries. And as a result of which, um, they are underpaid and they are underappreciated. As a result of which, even if you have a beautiful uh, nursing school like we have in Aga Khan University, Karachi, uh, we trained a lot of nurses. There's a great nursing school out here. But after a little while, I see that the migration starts to happen. These people, they, these, these really trained nurses who are really specialized start to move to Saudi Arabia. Some, some of them are moving to UAE. Some of them are moving to Kuwait. And, and I think that the inability to retain is uh, because of these two reasons that I mentioned, which is being underpaid and being underappreciated. Uh, the third challenge that I've seen in nursing is that there's a risk that advances in technology mean that patients are seen as physiological system and not peel. And again, the, the idea that I'm alluding back again and again, that the compassion and caring somehow, which is a hallmark of a nurse. When you think about a nurse, that's all you think about is that this is loving creature who's angel-like, who's gonna take care of me, who's gonna cure me. It sort of is, a, is an idea that I feel that is sort of losing uh, with the generation as the generations are passing. And I believe some part of it's of course an advancement of technology. One other challenge that I actually see is that the nursing, again, as I told you before, are seen as doctors and maidens. Um, mostly in the third world countries, when I was training in America, uh, I did not see that at all. Uh, even in the UK, when I have been there, I feel the nurses are, are very empowered over there. Uh, and they actually are the ones who are actually driving the doctors. They are the patient care advocates. They are the ones who tell the doctors, no, this is not right. This is not ethical. You are not talking to my patients correctly. And they are so empowered, these nurses, uh, that, um, uh, that the, the doctors have to listen to the nurses. And uh, this I've only seen in the first world country. In the third world country, I don't see that at all. And I feel that is the reason that the mass exodus of nursing happens from third world country to these first world countries. Uh, again, uh, as I said, the training remains basic in the third world countries. They are no, not, there are not many nurses who are doing specialized care as the one that I have told you before. The wages are low, they are uh, underappreciated, and the career progression becomes limited and non-existent. So these are the challenges, uh, four challenges that I see in a third, mostly in a third world country, but I actually have not seen in a first world country. In a first world country, an ICU nurse actually make a very, very decent wage as comparable to a doctor there. So what is different about neurosurgery and why nursing care is important? So I feel that because of the head and spine and the major injuries and the kind of care required, uh, the neuros the, every neurosurgical department should have 
dedicated nursing. Mm -hmm. Now, in big institutes there, where there are very large neurosurgical departments that have six, eight, or 10 neurosurgeons or 10 neurologists, then usually the nursing is very dedicated. But if you have a very small hospital and there's a private hospital, I feel that, you know, the, the uh, and this is why I'm talking about it because suddenly from Aga Khan, Karachi, I've gone to Multan in a smaller hospital. And I feel that because the nursing staff is not dedicated, how things are, that gets missed. And then the things that get missed is because, as we know, and Dr. Suresh Nair alluded to, that in the neurosurgery and neurology, the most important thing is clinical observation. Uh, the patient's neurological status is the biggest determinant uh, of uh, taking care of the patient in a timely manner. And if the nurses are not trained and they're not experienced, training we can give. But a lot of the learning comes from experience. And if it's not experience, they will miss out on the change in the GCS or the dilatation of the pupil or changing from a flexor to an extensive posturing. And somehow things get missed. And in, and in head and spine and head injury patients, especially, you cannot miss it in time. So um, uh, what the message I want to give is that even if there is a smaller, in, in bigger institute, that's not a problem. But if you are, if there is a smaller institute, again, dedicated nursing for neurosurgery and neurology is an absolute must. A general nurse cannot do neurosurgery and neurology. So they should be trained uh, they should be separated and their jobs should only be to do take care of neuroscience patients. Uh, similarly, uh, when you have major surgeries and if there is a clot in the brain or something happens to the spine and if the nurses are not experienced, they will certainly miss the boat. Um, so uh, to transform the neurosurgical experience, uh, as I said before, dedicated neuroscience nursing is important. And I feel that US plays a very important role right from the early 1900s to formalize a very dedicated neuroscience nursing. And these, and even the European nursing went to the US in early 1900s, started the course, and now of course, dedicated neuroscience nursing uh, is all over the world. And it is a very, very rewarding um, uh, field to go in. Um, uh, that's what I wanted to give the information to all the nursing out there. And it's a good career to choose uh, if you want to become a specialized nursing. So no matter how good the surgery is, if the nursing is not good, the patient will suffer. And as I said before, the nurses are the one who are there 24 seven with the patient and it is not the doctor. And, uh, and it's not just the skills, but also the compassion, the care and the, the, and the advocacy that they do for their patients. It's, it's a complete package. Until unless you have the complete package, uh, the, uh, the patient experience in a hospital will become very different. So raw talent is there, but passion for excellence is something that needs to be inculcated. I believe it should become a part of the nursing culture. It should start from the nursing school, from their basic level that you, you, that, uh, that you have to, that nursing is a holistic profession. And uh, one needs to be proud as you save as much lives as we do, diligence, and skill is important, but I think attitude is much more important. And skill takes you to one level, but being outstanding is again a mindset of taking responsibility and should be inculcated in every nursing student right from the beginning. So um, with that, I've talked about some of the roles uh, of the, the traditional roles, the the changing roles, the challenges that the first world and the third world are facing. And now what I wanted to talk about the future. And as Shakespeare said, what's past is prologue um, in the tempest. So um, uh, invasive monitoring like ICP, MRI, CT scan, ICUs have just become into the landscape in just in 1970s. What I still feel that there is no substitute 
uh, 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 to replace the observational skills, especially in neuroscience, critical thinking, caring attitude, and approach the patient holistically. And the technologies, although are amazing, so now you have ICP monitors and you have external ventricular drains, and then you have uh, um, uh, vagal nerve stimulators and deep brain stimulators, and they are and, and the and the nursing are taking care of all this stuff. These are amazing, but they are not the replacement for the basic. Um, uh, 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 the holistic approach that a nurse must take. What I feel that has happened from the early 90s to the to the this uh, this century is that the, 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 there's a high level of communication that has happened between the doctors and the nurses. What I used to feel even um, uh, as, as a junior doctor uh, working in Pakistan, I had felt that there was a massive disconnection between the doctors and the nurses. But I feel that disconnection is now decreasing down. And I feel that now in with this generation, the doctors and the nurses are considered equal. The nurses are not considered and handmaidens of the doctor, but there is an interprofessional team practice. And when the team practice happens, then only the safe and better patient outcomes happen. Um, and the evolving roles of neurosurgery will continue in the future. We will know that technology will advance. We will have nanotechnologies that will come in. We will have robotics. We will have AI that will come in. Um, individualized care will happen on genomic profiles. We already know some of the tumors we do in the brain. Uh, we do all the genetic testing. Chemotherapy becomes very specialized, especially in children with pediatric tumors. Pharmacogenics to design and match the patient to drug responsiveness is something that has already started and something that can be carried in the future for nursing as well. So in conclusion, I want to say that the fundamental core of a neuroscience nursing values on competencies of observation, critical reasoning, critical thinking, intervention, compassion, and caring, which were there in the past, are there in the future. The other point I also want to make that um, there are many, many specialized roles of nursing that are now there, which can help you to build up your career, both financially and uh, increase you to, uh, to take you another level of your career. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anila. Great lecture. Now I invite the uh, moderators of the session. This time, first to ask me, Anila, followed by KK Dure. Ask me, please. Uh, thank you, Shuresh. Uh, thank you, Anila. I really uh, enjoy your presentation. You uh, highlight a, a lot of uh, information, very important, uh, as well as to encourage the nurse. And uh, she presented about the history uh, and her personal experience encountered and uh, how she uh, have uh, experienced nurses uh, who are well-trained that help in terms of managing her cases. And she also start, uh, uh, touch a little bit about brief history and the development of uh, neurosciences, especially in neurosurgery. There used to be a combination of uh, neurosurgeon, neurology, and psychiatrists. And I'm very, uh, very happy that she also highlighted about the challenges that I would like to echo and some of the issues that she would like to raise. Uh, we have the same problem, uh, not only uh, in a country like Pakistan, but also developing country, especially in Southeast Asia. And I believe that uh, most of the nurses that in, uh, the, the, uh, in this seminar also may have the same problem. Uh, the nurses uh, used to be a gender specific uh, in our country, means nurse belongs to female. Yeah? But nowadays, it has changed. We have seen a lot of uh, nurses from a male gender. So this is something that uh, very good. And number two, we also seen that uh, last time, the nurses always under the control or the administration of uh, doctors. Yeah, but in our country, if we have changed that, we give them empowerment. So they are not directly under doctors, but they have their own director of nursing. Yeah. So in other words, they are answerable uh, to their uh, own director of nursing, and also allows them, uh, give them a freedom how they can develop how can they can fight eh, um, uh, for their career development. It's not only controlled by the doctors. So that is number two. And number three, it's important to provide training uh, for the nurses because neurosurgery or especially neuroscience is something, uh, is a very unique 
a specialty that changed very much. A lot of development move from time to time. So without proper training, so we about proper development that must come parallel. Not only the doctors develop a new technology, but also we must bring together with the nurses. Uh, back in our country, we introduced the post basic neuroscience course in 2006. So it's about six month course. It's a combination of neurosurgery and a neuro uh, medical uh, training. So uh, once they come out, we prepare them to be able to work, uh, not only in OR, but also to have uh, in the clinic as well as in award management. So they, they subsequently in 2018, we changed because we found that it's about time to upgrade uh, their training development. We upgrade into what we call it advanced neuroscience course. So it's up to one year. And uh, most of the nurses, even we allow them opportunity to learn while they are working. Because nurses is a very important community. Uh, once they go for training, you lost them. They come, let's say they go for six months, you don't have their service for six months. So this is a, uh, if, have a big impact uh, to the government, especially in the public sector. So they are allowed to take their uh, training in a degree in open system. So we have a nurses who has uh, undergo a training system uh, in a degree in nursing, and some even go up to higher level like masters. Yeah. So we allow them to do this uh, while uh, they are working. So this is important to make sure that we don't lose them. At the same time, we have their service. At the same time, we allow them to grow. And we also try to promote. There is some remuneration in terms of promotion and so on. And also very important as a doctors to remember that nursing is our front line. Eh? Most of the time, for example, the surgeon, we may spend uh, two or three hours or six hours in surgery but the rest are actually the patients spend time with the nurses. So they are our brain, our eye, our hand, front line. If the patient deteriorate, the nurses who are the first one who see the patient. So very important that we must train them. So we must make sure that when they make mistake, we, not all, uh, we do not punish them, but we try to make them learn and we need to educate them. Similarly, when we organize the courses, yeah, we not only organize the courses for doctors, that's why in 2010, so the first uh, Asian Neurosurgical Nursing Congress, eh, we hosted in Kuala Lumpur. And from, the, from there on, the Nursing Congress expand. And what you see now, we have uh, ACNN, the Asian Congress of Neurological Nurses. Uh, now, actually, the headed by uh, Metren Yi Yi Chang, actually one of our most uh, exemplary uh, leadership uh, in nursing, eh, which is working with, in our hospital before, but now she's retired. Why not she still join us back? So the other thing that we found that the challenges like what uh, Anila highlight is the remuneration. We found that their salary and so on are sometimes underpaid. So they are being uh, you know, pulled by the encouragement uh, to go to another city or another country that offer them more. So this is the thing that uh, we have to look into. And then also uh, you know, the training courses and so on uh, need to be uh, encouraged as well. So I during the pandemic. So the courses, uh, for example, yeah, the training and the advanced nursing uh, program uh, is uh, being affected. And uh, uh, some of the nurses also has been to redistribute eh, to cover the ward uh, to take over in terms of managing the pandemic. So there are hiccups. So this is uh, among the challenges that we face now, but we hope that uh, as the time goes, so all this pandemic will go and then we will get back to the track and I really appreciate uh, on behalf of myself or even uh, among the neurosurgeon, we have many new nurses here. So you are our main front line. Yeah? We really depend on you. So we hope we can work together. So we will give any support that we can uh, in order to make that you can develop uh, not only for the doctors, but also the nurses and also uh, for the development uh, in, in terms of your career, in terms of promotion and so on. So I think uh, that is my uh, simple comment. So maybe I pass to Professor Keki Turan. Probably he want to add anything. Keki, you, you are muted. Keki, you are muted. Uh, unmute. Yeah, OK. Fine. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, Anila. Wonderful seeing you. And such a nice and lucid presentation that you made today. I'm sure all the neuro nurses of uh, the Asian continent will be gladdened. You've given them so many important points and uh, so much of encouragement also. 
And I fully agree. I would echo many of the points that you have made, uh, especially for education and training on one side, uh, the importance and responsibility that we have to give them, and at the same time, empowerment. All these points were very nicely exemplified by you. But uh, uh, I think we have to understand that they are as important for our neurosurgical outcome uh, as we doctors are. Uh, whether it be in the OR or it be in the ICU or even in the floor. And therefore it is, if, if you have run a wonderful uh, operation and if your patient is not well taken care of, uh, finally, you cannot blame the nurse. You are responsible for it. So if something goes wrong and you say, oh, she did not, she did not uh, aspirate the patient. The, the, the patient has died of a vomit and he has aspirated. No, I think it is because you have not really given uh, sufficient education. When we go on our rounds, we frequently find the doctors forming the core in our in the, in the in they form a ring around the patient's bed, and the nurses are standing back row behind, holding the files like a little baby, and they are just physically there. Their mind is somewhere else, whether they are thinking of something different or not, but they are not there physically, they are not mentally, and therefore I always pull them in the front and I say, okay, tell me, you present the case to me. What do you think about the patient's condition? And then they start fumbling. So you have to give them responsibility and you have to teach them. This teaching should not come only from the nurses, the letters and the seniors or the juniors. I think our junior doctors who are going on rounds should also be teaching them the nuances of neurological examination. At least I, even as a consultant, still do that. I still bring the girls in the front and say, I ask them questions. Okay, what is this third nerve? What do you call it? Let me tell me the names of cranial nerves, 1 to 12. Or tell me what is the Glasgow Coma Scale? What does it mean? What does E, M, and B mean? So ask them questions which will make them think and tell them, okay, why is this like that? Why is a pupil dilated? What is the meaning of a dilated pupil? And so uh, if they are made to think that way, then they are made to understand that way, then they will immediately realize that, okay, something is wrong. It's not only a dilated pupil that matters. Even a constricted pupil can have a meaning even a non-reacting pupil can have a meaning. So all these small changes like bradycardia, how important it is for from the ICP point of view. So all these things are quite important. So we have to teach them. I always say that there are no bad students, only bad teachers. So if you are a good teacher, you will get a good neuro nurse. And I don't want to put the blame on the nurses. I want to say that we have to first teach them and first train them so that we can get the ultimately the benefit. Our patients will get the benefit of a good neuro nurse. And therefore education and training is the first seeds that you have to sow in order to get a, in order to reap a good harvest. Give them importance, give them, give them a pat on their back when they've done something very nice and keep on teaching them. Even in the OR, when we are operating, the nurses have come from different places and mind you, we surgeons are also very different. I want my instrument to be given to me in one particular way. They hold the forceps, so a nurse will hold the forceps from here. I said, no, hold it from the opposite side. This is my end. You can't hold it from this end. So how to hand over an instrument? Well, some surgeons are quite, uh, you know, they're not very particular about it or they want it in a different way. So you go on telling them, go on improving them, go on and telling them on, I mean, making them aware as to why what you're saying is correct or not correct. And then the third thing is, uh, the next thing is, that when, the, when we are going on rounds, sometimes we find that the patients, that the nurses are uh, in the station room and the patient is, uh, the, the, and, the, and the patient is in the ward, uh, as you said, lying with dirty linen or the IV line has leaked out or some blood is leaked out. And these girls, where are they? Nowadays, they are playing on their mobile, which is a very sad thing. I frequently find that instead of looking at the patients and giving them care, uh, they are busy with their phones. This damn telephone call, this telephone, mobile phones has really uh, been a, sometimes a curse instead of an advantage or a blessing. And we need to tell them to put their phones away and only use it for professional purpose. And even if they have time, they should not be spending their time on the mobile, but they can go and talk to the patient, give them a pep talk or hold their hand in, and take them out on a walk. It's not just the job of the physiotherapist. A new nurse will also do that. She will also call a ward boy or somebody, get the patient out, give them physiotherapy. It's not only the half an hour that the physiotherapy spends that is useful for the patient. Even the neuro nurse can do physiotherapy. So all these little things, but somebody has to encourage them. 
somebody has to teach them and tell them that these are your responsibilities not just uh, charging the tpr the blood pressure and giving the rice to the rice to fries to feeds to feeds it is not where your job begins and ends your job is as you mentioned holistic care of the patient take care of every aspect from the time they come to the time they leave or well, anila anyway you've done a wonderful uh, uh, teaching today and i don't think i have really significantly much more to contribute and uh, i must thank uh, yoko for this and yijang and all of you wonderful uh, nursing trainees and teachers who have organized this speci specially for uh, the neuro nurses i think we will be complete we will be incomplete completely incomplete without the neuro nurses we want to give them and equal we are, we are partners let us tell them that we are partners in patient care you are no less and i am no more we are equal partners in the final result that should be the message that they must get then they will feel good and strong about it thank, thank you. you thank you thank you kk and professor asmi for your pearls of wisdom before i give to anila for her final comments comments from professor yoko kato professor mochigan and also from uh, dr liu before i give to uh, anila for her final comments professor kato please Yes, this, but this is uh, the nurse uh, webinar, so I want to get some, some comment from Dr. E, uh, Mrs. E, and also Dr. Yanpei from uh, Shanghai. Yeah. Yanpei, how are you? Hi, everyone. Hi. So you can give us some comment, please. Uh, the whole so, webinar. Uh, I think uh, it's wonderful presentation from uh, Anila. Uh, talk about a lot of challenges of no in nursing uh, and also interested in uh, uh, as me Ali, Ali, Ali's uh, new training courses I think I oh, maybe we can talk more with you later a lot of things uh, I think it's very interesting uh, lots of challenging for uh, uh, for example about uh, how to improve the uh, nursing caring uh, progression. Uh, I think it's very important uh, things. So, uh, uh, I think we can, as uh, physicians as, and the nurses, we can uh, do some more on cooperation and can, uh, then we can improve the nurses', nurses uh, uh, values and uh, improve their technology and skills. And uh, of course, uh, important is uh, their attitude, maybe uh, changes in, uh, neuroscience uh, area. So I think uh, this is important. We can do more in these areas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you because we all expect the 13th Asian Congress, which will be held uh, in Shanghai, uh, okay. the, the Dr. Yeah. Dr. Mao in. Uh, yeah. We really expect it. Thank you. Yeah. The, the, is it October, the end of October? Yeah, yeah. Three days. We look forward to meet you in okay. Shanghai. Welcome. Uh, Trishna, thank you very much for your nice yeah. uh, In Japan, we have uh, the more and more the nurse practitioner uh, role, I think. So I think uh, Dr. Anila, uh, that she mentioned so many good things for improving and encourage of the nurse uh, uh, system. Uh, I think uh, uh, nurse uh, the already the as we said the former type of the nurse is just uh, uh, kind of the uh, so so called how do I say just uh, uh, they obey of the doctor's uh, instruction but I think uh, uh, in future I think uh, you should learn or uh, the more uh, uh, get the skills uh, as a nurse practitioner or a physician uh, assistant. At, that you can read the monitoring and also the ICU role and the ER role. Uh, I think then that you can assist more on the doctors at the work, I think. The, the, we need the ear support uh, as, a, the, as a neurosurgeon, I think. So we work together in the future. Uh, but today's uh, Dr. Anita's uh, uh, the talk was really excellent. Thank you very much. Shreshnayo. Okay, Professor uh, Mojgen, you want to pass some comments because you are 
We have woken up very early there. It's seven o'clock in Toronto. Please, see your comments. Sure. I, I want to thank Dr. Nila for a wonderful talk. Um, I think, uh, as uh, you said, if we think of our roles as part of a collaborative team and uh, work together within uh, that uh, team and continue communication, uh, education, and the different areas of collaboration. That's really how our teams will advance. So thank you so much for your talk. Dr. Liu, for your comments. Dr. Liu is there. Hello, hello, Dr. Suresh. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I do not have any comment. I thank congratulations uh, to uh, Dr. Anila. Thank you, Dr. Okay, okay. Now, lastly, I will hand over to Dr. Anila for our final comments before we wind up this great session. Anila, please. Uh, Dr. Nair, thank you for my comments. But my nursing director from my hospital, uh, Mahmoudul Hassan, is also here. And I would like him uh, to do the last closing comments. Thing. Okay, Mahmoud please, please. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for our team, for inviting me. And uh, it's a great time for me. Hello. Hello. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, can you listen to me? Hello. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we are uh, seeing you. You you have to be a little louder. Okay. I hope now I am audible. Yeah, you are audible. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me and it's a great pleasure for me to attend this virtual webinar and uh, it was really, really very helpful. Uh, I give special thanks to Professor Mogang for giving a wonderful uh, lecture on our trigeminal neuralgia and uh, I also uh, give special thanks to Dr. Anila and I am uh, and I also very excited that uh, today I see the perspective of a surgeon or doctor what they are the thinking about the nurses and where they want to move the nurses uh, actually at this time I realized that the doctor and nurses they they both are combined and joined together and they they actually focusing on the patient care they want the outcome they want the recovery of the patient so, uh, so they uh, they uh, actually highlight the challenges, and I am very excited, and uh, I I really surprised that she point out the actually the uh, the very good challenges which are actually the nursing profession is the facing. Number one was the brain drain, uh, which is truly said, uh, which is actually happening in uh, in our country also. Second is the technology. Technology is actually uh, giving uh, us uh, uh, some time for, uh, for monitoring purpose. But actual, the clinical understanding is closely, is mainly depend, depend on the observation. So which is particularly related to the nursing. So at the end, uh, I also thanks to host, co-host and, uh, and the chairman for organizing such a beautiful session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anila, for your last comments before we we have to stay back for a photo session. That is what I have got. Okay. Anila, for your last comments. <laughs> uh, my last comment is uh, about Dr. Yako Kato. She is my ideal. She is somebody I aspire to be. She, she is conducting this beautiful webinar, seminars for everybody whether they're nurses, they're junior doctors, they're senior doctors, they're neurosurgeons. And uh, I think she is the biggest unsung hero in the neurosurgical community. That's Absolutely. my last comment to her. Absolutely correct, yeah. Okay, I, I think we will all stay back for a photo. I think uh, uh, we are ready for the photo and then I think we'll wind up. Thank you all the nurses who have joined. This session was for you people only. And I saw so many people attended this program. And thanks once again, we stay back for a photograph. I think Professor Cato should come to the middle top and then we will click a photograph. Please click a photograph until it's over.
thank you thank you very much okay. thank you thank very you, much thank you Suresh. thank you thank you thank you thank you thank thank you thank you so much thank you thank you thank you so much thank you 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 th